All right, we are excited to talk bot equality. Um, I am going to lead off on this um, partially just as like, you know, a recognition of JCP, like greeting the day. Um, but so much of this really is her brainchild. And so she's going to jump in and add lots of color commentary. And then I want us to have time for Q&A and discussion at the end. So um, there is this I think long known disconnect that the clothing industry and the fashion industry have been out of touch. Um, I love, I really had a hard time choosing from Devil Wears Prada between this quote, zero is the new two, two is the new four, six is the new 12. Um, and Meryl Streep saying, um, I said to myself, hire the smart fat girl about Anne Hathaway, um, which I laughed out loud when I heard that for the first time, because her reference to her is this smart fat girl is the sk like skinnier than I've ever been, you know, since elementary school. Um, so there's like this disconnect between, you know, the kind of standards um, of size and sizeism and fashion and in film. And then the reality that the average American woman wears a size 16 to 18, um, which most like mainstream retailers either weren't serving at all or were serving in pretty paltry ways, which we'll talk about. Um, and yes, there are plus size offerings, but plus actually was part of the problem in a lot of cases. Um, for those who have you know ever shopped for plus size clothing, you'll often find that there's like a much smaller selection. So all of the styles are not available in your size. Um, for a lot of stores, maybe you know 16 plus is only available online. Um, if they are online, there's a separate ex or if they are in store, there's a separate experience, a separate section with much fewer SKUs and much fewer styles, um, sometimes different styles and different pricing. Um, so even like the offering for plus size was just not a great experience when it's available. And, you know, I think in culture, tastemakers have been making some noise from like Chrissy Teigen talking about, like speaking out that she's no longer a sample size um, to models like Ashley Graham saying, I don't want to be called a plus size model. I'm just a model. Um, and actually in 2020, more than 68 um, plus, plus size or, you know, size 14 plus models like walked the runway. So in some cultural circles, you're starting to see this conversation happen, um, which makes a ton of sense. If you just like look at the disconnect between the fashion standards and the reality for most women. Um, but that wasn't really translating like from the catwalk to the sidewalk, let alone to shelves in the way that, that real women shop. Um, so we, and I'm, I'm using the Royal we of Old Navy, um, started to ask questions like, why do sizes have to be called plus sizes or petite? Like, why can't they all just be called sizes? Um, like, why do you have to be seen as a deviation from the norm um, when you are a size that represents so many American women? Um, and this idea of like one size fits all, the sample size, like it fits hardly anyone at all. And so really just starting to kind of question the conventions of why the industry has to operate this way. Um, this is a quote from a consumer interview we did when we were working on the creative campaign um, where she talked about the fact that like she doesn't get to have the experience of like clothing shopping with friends um, because when she does go in, and shop with for clothes with friends and she's um, I think like probably a size 30 um, she's like most stores don't have my size so I just have to stand there and watch them try on clothes you think about shopping is this like really social um prototypical like girlfriend experience and she's like yeah I've never gotten to have that experience I either don't go or I go and it's awkward um, or I go and it's lonely because there's just really nothing for me which kind of broke our hearts um, and it's not just about like the merchandising and the store experience so that's significant it's even the way the clothes are constructed um, that had to change so most retailers um, start with a size four or six and like scale up um, which means that everything just gets proportionately bigger um, and not just like wider, but taller. Cause again, these things are just kind of done to scale um, versus actually um, setting styles based on like an array of models. Like JCP, do you want to talk about this at all? This sure. idea of how you guys tackle this? Yeah. So we have one fit model in-house um, and she has a traditional size. She has a size six. And so as we thought about how do we actually merchandise and create the clothes that fit everyone, we hired another in-house fit model who is traditionally known as plus size. She's a size 20. We also worked with scientists and 
um, we created these avatars. I think we interviewed around 600 different women with all sorts of shapes and sizes and body loves and body woes to figure out what do real woman body shapes look like and then fit according to that, right? So it wasn't just to Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's point, sort of a scaled up model, um, but super thoughtfully considering how each woman looks and also how they want their clothes to fit, right? Flattering is sort of subjective to everyone. Um, and so we really thought about that as well when we were thinking about the clothes. Yeah. So one, one other point that I loved from the quote that Elizabeth sourced, um, you know, that was a size 30 woman talking about her experience when we actually interviewed what we call in the industry straight size women they were really, really surprised that there wasn't this equitable experience. They actually um, didn't think about how their fellow sisters, friends were shopping. And so when they found out that there were either separate sections or no sections at all, or this less than experience, um, not only was it surprised, but they did question us, right? And said, why aren't we giving this equitable experience? So I think that was just a really interesting way that we considered the campaign holistically as not just a plus size, but actually just for all women of all sizes. Yeah, it's a really good point. Like when we were doing the interviews, like that one in particular, like everybody was kind of like humbled by it, partially like humbled by... Um, our own like lack of empathy or visibility. Like I'd never thought about that before, you know? Um, and, and once you do, you're like, well, wait a minute, that's not right. We all kind of want to jump in and, and do something different. So obviously this goes beyond merchandising. Um, and I think while there's been progress in representation, like using the example um, from Fashion Week, but also if you think about like Dove and Athleta and all these like amazing brands that are starting to show um, a broader spectrum of like women's bodies. Um, you saw you saw progress there, but you didn't really see equality. Like JCP, do you want to talk about this piece, like the competitive landscape? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because we do have such a huge footprint, right? There's there's stores nationwide. Old Navy is ubiquitous. Um, the idea of, I would say body diversity is not new for the industry. You'll notice all of these competitors are actually speaking to, let's say representation, right? And style, those are actually pretty well represented. But the idea of, um, so that's so that's this idea of, of um, size representation or just diversity, but the idea of offering more size range and an equitable experience in all styles and at the same value and thinking about fit, kind of checking off all of these boxes holistically as far as what are we offering the customer just hasn't been done. Um, I'll point to smaller brands. I think, for instance, Universal Standard um, or Third Love or Eloquy, they're doing some really amazing things as far as storytelling, as far as sort of emotional reach to their customer, um, but at the size and scale of a brand like Old Navy, or let's say a brand like Target, it's really Old Navy wanting to be an industry standard and saying, not only can we offer representation and imagery, um, but this idea of full size range, full style choice at the exact same value, um, with amazing, an amazing focus on fit and quality. So I think that was really the breakthrough for a brand like Old Navy. Yeah, I think so too. And, and my guess is that for like women who were shopping like the 16 plus, um, I'm sure there's like great joy that there is more style that the mod cloths of the world and the universal standards of the world um, have like broadened the aperture of what's available and the representation is all nice. I think from the outside, people could have looked at that and been like, great, mission complete, like problem solved. Um, but to your point, there wasn't this equitable experience, like the, the fit and the design was not being done as thoughtfully. Um, the accessibility for like an IRL shopping experience wasn't the same. Um, so I love this one because I think sometimes 
um, when you see like a rush of brands going in to address a problem, you can be like, oh, I guess there's no white space there. And one of the things I love about this is that like Old Navy kind of looked at all of it and was like, where is there still work to be done? You know, where are people not still getting like the level of access that they deserve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting because one of the ways we focus was this approach of alienation to all inclusive. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth and I have been working on our shared purpose. And a lot of that is around inclusivity and access and what does that mean? So um, I think that the big push on this campaign was to not just make it a plus size campaign, but to say that this was about inclusivity and equitability and what would that look like? What would that sound like? Um, how would that be received if that was the case, right? And so, of course, there's a population of, you know, the average size of being 16 to 18 that were not being seen or received in the way that they should. But this idea of everyone is able to come to the party, everyone is able to join this experience. Yeah, I love that. And all of this... Um was rooted like really in old Navy's kind of like history and heritage. Like this idea of democracy of style goes all the way back to the beginning. And, um, you know, as we've been working on the brands, like, you know, purpose and platform together, like I love, I love it when we're telling a story that that goes all the way back to the beginning. And when you're building from building blocks that have always been a part of the company's DNA, um, you know, once upon a time, like pre the fast fashion revolution, fashion was for people in big cities with big budgets. And it was really kind of adults only and very self-serious. Um, and from the early 90s, like Old Navy introduced this concept of democracy of style um, and brought, you know, fashion in a lot of ways to like middle America and people with like, you know, middle or small budgets um, and took it from adults only to family friendly, from pretentious to playful. Like this has always been a democratizer brand and a brand that's about giving access and inviting people in. Um, and so when you have that as part of your company's DNA, then you're asking the question like, who's not at the party? Like who doesn't have access? Who still needs to be invited in? Where's the work not done yet? Um, and so, you know, as, you know, JCP and the team did this work and they looked at the competitive landscape landscape, this idea of like, not just um, body diversity, but size equity. And this shouldn't be something that only matters to plus size shoppers. Like this is actually a philosophy that impacts the way that this brand serves everyone. We want to serve everyone equitably, um, I think was just like a really beautiful unlock. And so JCP, do you want to talk about the naming process? Sure. I love the story. Yeah. So um the naming is always really, really interesting, right? So we get handed the brief, which essentially is sort of a cut down of what we've all been talking about and what Elizabeth has so eloquently laid out for us. And then it's the work of the work of the creative team to say, okay, so how would we translate this to the audience in a way that is memorable, that is um, true to tonality, how can we bring it to life through visions and um, hopes and dreams and wishes, right? So I'll say I'm a total word girl. Um, it's very, very important to me to say, sort of have the thought process of how do we get to this place. Um, body quality, we landed on maybe 40 different taglines in, just to say this is sort of the thought process of working with a team, going through brainstorms, thinking in the shower, thinking with my husband, um, thinking as I'm feeding my twins food and all those sorts of kinds of weird revelations, kind of looking around outside at billboards, um, at the back of soda cans. And so really like the, the idea of equality, right? This idea of, um, size equality in every style was a big one. They wanted to make sure they, meaning the overarching leadership team at Old Navy, um, that this was a celebration, a true celebration of what we're doing. Um, and true to Old Navy fashion, really sort of lightning fast. Like if this was on a billboard, how quick could someone get yeah. the concept? So we landed on body quality. I think one thing about this, um, you know, I was trying to kind of portmanteau some words together. 
I tried for about 24 hours to get equality body to work in my head. This is sort of the heyday of the body yaddy yaddy song. So I was thinking, is there something there? Um, really, it's sort of combining this very larger than life idea um, all together, right? You'll notice that it's three words wrapped in one, bod, which really just symbolizes size and shape, equality, which is very much what we're talking about, the emotional state of this. It's also, I would say, part of the cultural conversation right now of who, who does feel like there is equity in any kind of experience. So there's something about that that felt very culturally attuned, very culturally relevant. And then quality in this word as well, which is very much about the product, right? The experience of the product, the experience of the fit. So all together, this idea of body quality. Old Navy does a lot of portmanteaus and we've done it really, really well. So I think that has the only Old Navy wit and wink that a lot of us internally talk about. Um, the X clam gives it that added confidence, that added optimism. And then of course, this sign off of we deserve it was also super, super important because as we talk about this as a conversation, we're always sort of wanting to have this relatability with the customer of not us and them, but we. And so we deserve it was written as everyone on this call that has had either a good or bad shopping experience, usually bad, right? It's like, we deserve something that's better than that. And, um, you know, there is sort of equal rights in this experience. And so that really kind of just topped it off as um, the emotional undercurrent of this whole concept. It's be beautifully said. Um, and if we go to the next one, we've got some of the, like, I know you you touched on a number of these, but like, this is like some of the thinking. I love this slide. So um, JCB is being very humble. She's not just a work girl. She's like the voice of the brand. Um, and so it is, is super fun to always like, like think through these things on this very deep level. And um, I, I love just like all of the, the little things underneath this, to your point, in terms of like the old Navy wink, which we talk a lot about, the confidence, the optimism, um, the idea that like, while this is launching with women, the concept of bot equality is gender neutral. And, and is this is the kind of first step in a larger initiative on behalf of the brand um, and that it wrapped these things together kind of all in one word. And it's a super quick get like bot equality doesn't take a ton of explaining, which we love. Um, you know, so this was kind of, you know, the impetus behind like the initiative and everything else. Like if 68% of women in the U.S. are over a size 16, we're on a mission to make shopping better for 100% of them. So as JCP said, this is not a plus size initiative. This is a philosophy that everyone deserves the same experience and a better experience, like an elevated experience over what they've seen so far. Um, so I'm going to call in my work girl if you want to read this <laughs> in your language. Well, this is kind so, of a launch to the world. Yeah, you know, it's so funny is one of the 50 original tagline slash concepts that we floated was this concept of woman everywhere. And so to Elizabeth's points, we got to a place that was about gen a gender neutral concept because um, we have actually already been actively working on bringing body quality to the men's divisions and also to kids divisions. But one of the early concepts was this idea of woman everywhere, right? This reach and scale of who we're talking about. And so we actually found a home for it in this sort of letter format. Um, a lot of people are doing letter formats. We've actually taken it a step further, but this is one um, example of how we are talking to the customer in a super relatable way and also galvanizing the customer to say, um, let's do this together, right? So this Dear Woman Everywhere was everywhere. Um, everything from billboards to out of home to your digital considerations to write into your, your mobile phone. Um, we had the biggest buy that we've ever seen when we, think, when we think about advertising and we think about the launch day and the launch week. Um, so this one, we're really asking and inviting the customer to start a fashion revolution with us. Now in all stores, online, wherever you find us, you'll find all styles, all sizes, same price. 
That's right. The same style is the same price, no matter the size, because you deserve it and your friends do too. Um, some really interesting context is when we get to a really grand scale campaign like this, legal is very involved. We're very intimate with our legal friends. And there's a lot that we can say, and there's a lot that we can't say. And I think that's really interesting as marketers of how do we tell a story that feels super compelling, but also won't slap us with um, a crazy lawsuit, right? So for instance, that parenthetical right there, the that's right, the same style is the same price, no matter the size, that was not in early drafts. That was added in later on um, because it was sort of a legal implication to not saying something like that. So just kind of interesting context for, for people on the call is it's always sort of a, a conversation of um, how do you balance compelling messaging with the, the legal heat that it might imply later on. <laughs> yeah, you guys, for, for people still in school, you'll be amazed how often like lawyers are involved <laughs> before we get to final drafts of anything and negotiating with lawyers. Like I can imagine somewhere that um, this was read legally as being promissory that like everything in the store was going to be the same price. Like all styles, all sizes, same price. Like every, it's like five and below. Um, and that if if everything is not the exact same price in the store, not the same skew, and like in every price, then somebody was going to get sued. But you did it in such a colloquial and human way. Um, so introducing bottle quality. Uh, do Do you want to talk at all, JCB, about like the models that were used and like even just like the visual language? Sure. Um, so this, the still that we're sitting on right now is actually part of a, you can imagine the whole company was super, super excited about this, right? There was literally like an internal countdown clock of when August 20th would hit, which was the day that body quality changed the world. Um, so what we're staring at is um, an actually an internal video slash still that was created as part of our town halls to get the entire company galvanized. Um, and these are three women who were very instrumental to body quality internally. Um, the visual language of even the graphics were super interesting to us. You'll notice, for instance, the E is actually an equal sign as well. Um, so there is a little bit of symbol symbolism baked into the actual word there. Um, we can talk later on, I think, when we're seeing some more of the marketing imagery around casting, but we did cast in a very, very different way um, and meaning a lot more diversity and even just personal expression and personal style. Um, so we'll see that a little bit later. Um, we had our first trans woman as part of this cast as well, which was special for us. Um, We've never had that before. I think it's it's really interesting because these conversations internally are always about like pushing the brand forward, right? Not just in this idea of, hey, now we're going to offer an equitable shopping experience to everyone, but how do we make sure that people are represented in ways that they've never been represented before? This is great fodder for conversation. And certainly we're not going to stop at body quality. It's just kind of been pushing the... Um, pushing yeah. the revolution forward in all sorts of ways internally. Love it. So this is this is um, some of the launch work. I've got a little bit of like kind of imagery. And as JCB said, I mean, we're talking from bus shelters to billboards to digital and everything in between. Um, but I love, you can see like, not just the visual language, but also kind of the, the vocabulary, no shame in this game, no more bodsplaining. Like it really does um start to like create new length like new shared language and new shared culture um around raising people's expectations of what they should experience from a retailer in this space um, and this is something i actually pulled off of social but this does some of the explaining i know we've talked about it a little bit but even just like the consumer education i my, my i imagine that um, even most like, you know, what would can have been considered plus size shoppers, um, like they might have known that plus size clothes didn't seem like they, they fit or they laid as well, um, but probably couldn't have told you why. And so even just kind of explaining, um, you know, that most companies use a single fit model as a sample size and then add or subtract, 
Um, but that's really important because being three X doesn't mean you're six foot five. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, one of the things I love about this campaign is I think it like raises people's expectations for everyone. Like Old Navy is like in the vanguard uh, of this, but I think part of the consumer education is like educating everybody on what they should expect, like what a quality mm -hmm. should look like. So this is some of the social content. Um, Elizabeth, can we just pause there? Because I, I think that this post was also so interesting. Um, this was actually the most engaged with post throughout the entire body quality campaign. Second was A.D. Bryant. And there was about 1,000 comments on this one, not only just because um, of the content here and, you know, the idea that we were celebrating we were celebrating something and also adding context is something that a lot of brands um, don't right now or are lacking the context, but also even subtle things like the pronoun inclusion. People were talking about that as well. I mean, I think it's just really interesting because usually we need to fight for content that is so copy heavy, right? And not necessarily visually rich in the sense of we're not necessarily selling product here. We're not talking about a pair of jeans or a top that someone's wearing. Um, and so this just seemed like a great marker of actually our community is craving a little bit more context and but the behind the scenes -y type of, um, of, of language, right? And relatability. So just a really great one to pull. I'm so happy you pulled this one. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think people people are maybe smarter than we give them credit for, um, and more curious than we give them credit for. And like, obviously, there's a ditch on either side. Like, one is, um, you know, I think a lot of category marketers can get so myopic about the world of their small thing um, that they assume everyone cares about it or thinks about it as much as they do. Um, once upon a day, I, I worked on I. It was like a consulting project I did, and um, the, the client's title was director of salty snacks. <laughs> and like mm -hmm. the, you, the entire universe of this marketing organization, and I think this happens a lot because they were spending all day thinking about salty snacks, and thus assumed that everyone else in the world spent all day thinking about salty snacks. And so when they wanted to go deep on something, there was sometimes a lack of self awareness um, about how much time people were thinking about you know their mental real estate. Um, and so like that's one ditch, but I think the other ditch is to be like everything has to be super simple. People have the attention span of a goldfish. You know, you've got two seconds and, and put the cookies on the lowest possible shelf. And to me, this actually strikes this really lovely balance of like treating them as like smart, curious, um, you know, consumers of like content and citizens in the world and going a little bit deeper, but doing it in a way that is like winsome and human and engaging. Um, and I'm not surprised it's at the highest. Oh. Engagement. All right, keep going. Uh, so when it came time to launch this incredible initiative into the world, um, we knew that we wanted um, someone who had kind of like a big footprint and a, a big voice. And specifically, we wanted um, a partner from a talent perspective that wasn't just um, representative of the community this was serving, but someone who really, um, in their own work, was advancing the conversation around these issues. And so I just, I don't, I don't know what would have happened if we hadn't gotten 80. I, I really just can't imagine. Um, but with the work that she had been doing with Shrill and like her inclusion on SNL, um, yeah, we just felt like she really embodied the message in a lot of ways and was often writing characters that were asking hard questions about, you know, some of the bullshit in the world um, that people who are, you know, 16 plus experience. And so she felt um, like the right partner. And I'll say she did, she does not do a lot of commercial work. We weren't sure if we were going to be able to get her for that reason. Um, but she so loved the work and like the, the authenticity of the work, that it wasn't surface level representation, that it was really significant progress, um, that she was excited to be a part of it. And so I'm going to um, attempt, I know Zoom can be a little glitchy when playing video, but for anyone who hasn't seen it, I'm going to play this one real quick. Should I be doing something? I am a 
I'm a dancer now. So it seems like um, one reading of this is that it's just like, you know, body diverse people dancing in a range of sizes, but there's actually like a lot happening in the spot. So even 80s like evolution, like in the beginning, she's like, am I supposed to be doing something to like, oh, we're dancing to I'm a dancer now. Like you see this kind of like arc of confidence and realization that she goes through in the course of this. Um, and even just to cast like amazing dancers in an array of sizes. Cause often when you see dancers cast in just about anything, like it's following the same tropes um, as the fashion and film industry. JCB, I don't, not to put you on the spot, but I don't know if there's any other things on the spot you want to kind of call out. I mean, I think, you know what I think is so interesting too, as we're talking about casting 80 and the authenticity of it, I just, I was reminded of when she posted, right? We have contractual agreements with these celebrities. She posted not only this commercial, but the blooper reel, which is also phenomenal to watch. But when she posted this commercial, it garnered, um, 1,592 comments, okay, which is a lot for her, for her, for her Instagram, or for Instagram. A couple weeks earlier, she posted about her um, Emmy nom for Shrill, and that garnered 600 comments. So literally on par with her Emmy nomination was her posting this ad. Um, and I think it was because she was such a great person like the exact person to be part of this commercial that it did feel so authentic and it really felt like it was an amazing partnership so I agree so much with Elizabeth of like what would we do without 80 in this spot and I think that's kind of just like the main thing that I want to point out is um a lot of the creative is all in the execution right and in the casting and how authentic does it feel? How natural does it feel? And this one, um, I think is sort of gold standard of how we wanna be doing this kind of work. Yeah, and I think for you guys and in the Q and A, we can talk um, a little more granularly about implications if it's helpful, but you know, a lot of marketers use celebrity now in kind of hopes of like leveraging just like borrowed interest in their platform, um, but like, which celebrity for which brand and which initiative matters. And it will be expensive no matter what to work with a celebrity. So if you're going to do it, either using like a really surprising celebrity in a really surprising way, or using like a deeply like authentic celebrity in a really authentic way, which I think is probably more where 80 falls. It was surprising in that she doesn't do a lot of brand work, but um, I, I, I think I agree with JCP. It was like the authenticity of like, this is what her platform is about. It's about moving this conversation forward in terms of like how, um, you know, plus size people are like seen and represented and treated. Um, if anyone's not seen Shrill, I highly recommend it. In the pilot, there's this moment um, where this like fit personal, um, I was gonna say fit talker, it's not a fit talker, like a, a personal trainer walks up to her in a coffee shop and like, like just like gets in her space and puts her hand around her wrist and is like, you, like look at your wrist. She's like, there is a skinny person in you dying to get out. And you're watching it and you're like, oh my God, like who says that? But like these kind of like indignities that her character faces all the time are, are things that are kind of like hidden in plain sight that a lot of people experience. Um, but most celebrities would never call attention to that because they would have like Im embodied or, or absorbed um, some of the shame that our culture treats people with. And yet 80 has always been about calling the stuff out. And so using her, I think had kind of a knock on effect of, you know, something that gets you way beyond like hashtag sponsored post. Should I? Oh, should I? Um, and then in the social, um, I think, Shopping is meant to be this like lovely social experience, but one of the things we found is that that's not historically been true um, for women who are, you know, 14 or 16 plus. And so we also created some like great social content on that same shoot. And so this is one where um, people can upload a video of them like at home, like trying on something um, and get a squad of like body positive girlfriends weighing in on their fit. So you can see- Are you ready yet? Can you show us? Ooh, yes, that's so good. Really good, right? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, good. Okay, now can we see the back? Oh, 
Okay, that's it. We did it. And there's more like that's like actually one of my favorite Love things. It. Yeah. Because it's so it's so rooted in um, one of the ways, like one of the experiences that this group of shoppers had kind of been deprived of. Like they didn't get to have that experience in the dressing room with their girlfriends before now. So having like this fierce, positive, joyful, um, body positive act, like advocate weighing in on your jeans and being like, let me see the back. That's <laughs> um, which is one of my favorite. So I love the way this extended into social. Um, oh, good. I wish we could have that in the fitting rooms, right? Just like press here for affirmation and then oh, there's like idea. plays in a loop. We should look into that. Instead of a press here for, for assistance, press here for affirmation. So we so I love that idea. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's a really good one. Um, yeah. And so to JCP's point, hers, her posting this work herself had a ton of like love. Um, and you can see like how many celebrities got in there and were just like cheering her on like Questlove and Nick Kroll and, um, Bravo Andy and like some of our favorites, but people were like, like happy for her and celebrating with her and with the brand. Um, and just this like really lovely, authentic way. Mm -hmm. Um, one thing I'll also say, I noticed that there's Old Navy up in there as well. At the launch of Body Quality, we also launched a new initiative on social, which was um, essentially just Old Navy confetti out in the world, right? One of the initiatives we have that Elizabeth has been instrumental in is um, participating in cultural conversations that make sense for the brand. It's all about sort of confidence um positivity right there is like some some circles of where we are and we've been doing um great commenting on our own feeds of course but also just culturally relevant feeds people that we love um let's say for instance Adele's album came out yesterday right we've been all over Adele's feed and what's really amazing about that as a brand like Old Navy is it's unexpected and people are commenting and having conversations with us outside of the normal spaces. And so that not only helps with engagement, but also um, I think just not our own engagement, but engagement in conversations, engagement where it's surprising, where it feels a little bit more fresh. Um, and then, of course, I think it is like, hey, I never thought of Old Navy in this way. Maybe I should go and check out a store. Maybe I should go online and see what they have happening online. So um, just a really interesting thing that I've been noticing some brands doing really, really well. And so that was sort of a push for us to do it as well in a way that feels real and owned. Yeah, I think a little bit of like what we're asking or what we're saying is like, what are the people that we care about care about? And how do we like show up and play in those conversations? Um, and, and I think that a lot of brands are kind of starting to realize that like what you say on your own social is that kind of like, it feels more like marketing because it's more of the one way conversation. You can and should integrate like your brand voice and your values and all of that is great. But what seems to really... Um, delight, you know, consumers in a lot of ways is when you have these moments where they're like, oh my gosh, you're paying attention to that. It's so like one of the early ones we did um, before Britney's conservatorship ended um, is we mocked up like an old Navy store, but the old Navy signs had free Britney instead of old Navy. Um, and I think, you know, the interwebs like just loves that the brands are paying attention and you don't want to comment on everything. You want to jump into the conversations that make sense for the brand, either through the lens of your values or like the things your audience cares about. Um, but those can and often um, get the most kind of love, uh, which we can we can talk about more later. And so this really did go um, from feeds to fame. Um, I had like pages and pages and pages of, um, of press clips from this. Um, and so I won't take you through all of them. But one of the things that I loved was that this wasn't just showing up in the trade press. It wasn't just showing up and on like ad week and ad age are great. Um, but it was the fact that like Vogue and pop sugar and like women's world daily was like, um, women's world daily was taking old Navy serious, seriously as a 
fashion brand and as a voice that's changing fashion as an industry. So that's something that we really, really love. Um, and we can't share some of the business results just yet. Um, so we're going to focus on kind of the earned results for now. Um, but it drove the single largest day for PR in the brand's history, more than 2 million impressions, um, over 200 outlets. Um, and on social, it outperformed other content that we had done for this audience. So the chatter has been fabulous. Um, and I think more than anything, like, Brands put so much time and energy into wanting to be differentiated, and I think that's amazing. Um, I also think that um, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And so I always hope that like we're pushing the industry forward and setting new standards that our, that our competitors will have to chase us on. Um, and so this idea of a quality of experience like, is a differentiator right now. Um, but eventually, I hope um, more retailers decide that equality is something that all of their customers deserve. Um, and then we'll just find a new frontier to push and we'll keep kind of pushing the world and the industry forward. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a second so we can chit chat, um, but that's kind of the, the highlights of the case study. Woo, yeah. thank you so much. Um, let's get to some questions. Um, Joe has a question that says, I love what Old Navy is doing in terms of size equality. Does Old Navy see a market for adaptive clothing for folks of different abilities? You want to take that, yes. Jason? Yeah, yes. Um, you know, it's so interesting as we've had many, many conversations around um, what is Old Navy going to do next? Um, what are we frankly, behind on. Adaptive clothing is one that has been brought up many, many times. I was actually just in a meeting earlier this week um, with our head of kids merchandise. And uh, he was a big proponent of how do we actually think about the kids business and revolutionize the kids business in a big way. Um, and of course, adaptive clothing was brought up in that aspect. I think one thing that Old Navy is really good about um, is being um, very considerate and thoughtful as far as how they approach how they approach anything, right? So when we talk about body quality, that was about five, six years in the making from the start of when we talked about, hey, we actually need a really equitable experience for our core customer, right? Um, to the launch of body quality. Not to say that adaptive clothing is going to take five or six years. I think we recognize the need to be much more agile and much more nimble when we're bringing things to market that are very, very important now. Um, but it is something that we're talking about and we're talking about very thoughtfully. We do have sort of a plan in place. There is a tiger team of people that are working on doing the research right now, um, understanding what the needs are for the market, where Old Navy's unique positioning can come into place, and then we're going from there. Um, but just all this to say that they are active conversations, and many people in the business um, are are pushing, right? And it's about the it's about the pushing, and it's about trying to prioritize what we want to do first. Um, and there's a lot of conversations around where we're sort of still needing to be more inclusive, um, where access still seems to be missing for certain um, audiences and adaptive is certainly one of them. Yeah, one thing I just wanna add on to that, and there's some other great questions in the chat. One of the things that um, I truly and deeply love about this brand and this team is this commitment to kind of continuing to push forward. Um, I think that you will always have conversations with clients, or if you are a client, or, or if you are on the brand side when you're out in the world, uh, about what do we, do we have to have something perfect before we can talk about it, right? Um, and that's always challenging because on one hand, you don't want to be out there talking about something that you can't live up to. Um, you don't want to be all sizzle and no steak. But on the other hand, if you wait until everything is perfect, you will be waiting forever and you will have no impetus, you know, for moving forward with speed. 
Um, and I do think in many ways that like perfect can be the enemy of progress. And so like, I love that Old Navy was willing to like come out and make this big statement and say, hey, we're starting with women, knowing that like bought equality for men's and kids was coming. Um, you know, I love that the conversations we're having with them are about like what started as a line of, um, of like all gender clothes that in the store um, were kind of pulled together, not in the men's section or the women's section, but in the middle. Um, and there was someone on TikTok who posted this video, um, someone who is not, not, uh, was, was not gender conforming or not. Yeah, I, I can't remember specifically how she identified, but talking about um, what that meant walking into the store and seeing stuff that was like not in the men's section or the women's section, um, but was in this middle space and feeling like seen by a retailer for the first time, um, which I think we all cried about. <laughs> um, but then even the conversations about like um, gender neutral versus all gender. And can you really say gender neutral um, if, you know, we don't have the same level of thoughtfulness yet in terms of like layout and design and sizing. And so even though we're having those conversations on a regular basis, and then you talked about the adaptive clothing, so many retailers would be like, that's too big a problem to solve, or it feels like too big a problem for too small an audience or, um, what have you. And yet this group of people has a commitment to living into this idea of equality, knowing that it's going to be hard and that it's going to take some figuring out, um, which is something that makes me really proud to partner with them. So I just wanted to throw that out. Um, let's look at some of the other questions in the chat. I think this is a great one. Um, you know, this idea obviously has big cost implications across the supply chain. Um, JCB, let's talk about the kind of business rationalization um, for how to make an investment like this and kind of how we can translate that into selling big ideas that are going to require a lot of operational change. You want me to take this one on? <laughs> you want to take that one first? I can add color commentary. <laughs> Hold on. I got to read it. I will. Andrew, you've given like a really, really thoughtful question <laughs> and I am, I am really not as, can you talk about the business rational? Okay. Um, are you talking about body quality in general? I think so. Just the, the amount of like cost and time that has to go right. into like changing right. the way you do fit, changing the way you do design, distribution. This is way more than a marketing campaign. And it's really easy to be like, that breaks our brain a little bit. It's yes. too hard. Yes. I, I mean, you know, what's so interesting is I've been at the brand for over five years. I want to say a couple of years ago, we were supposed to come out with um, some, uh, some messaging around price equality. And I remember it was approved through leadership and we were scrambling to figure out how do we just, how are we able to say this as quickly as possible? And then it was pulled um, because of the cost implications. So like a kind of like a really, really quick yes. And then a really fast no um, back to what we're doing right now. I think one of the biggest things that we thought about was just um, customer loyalty and also um, customer engagement, you know, and I, and I think this was something that we, again, same thing as, as we're talking about sort of um, what are, where are we going with gender? Where are we going with adaptive ideas and adaptive clothing? I think it's a similar conversation of um, if we're going to not only stay relevant to our customers, um, not only keep the customers, retain the customers we have, but also garner new customers and new loyalty, um, these become not just a business idea, but um, a, a brand idea, right? So I think that's a lot of the conversation is um, we have been talking a lot about cost implications of what we're doing, for instance, with body quality, what that means for the customer and where do we end up um, thinking about how to how to continue our line. I mean, right now we're a $10 billion company and we want to do even more. So I think that's kind of the, the conversation that we have a lot. Um, another thing I'll say just about this idea of um, cost and where we're going in that place, I'll say that we are trying to go from a value brand, right? Which is one that offers a lot of discounts, one that offers a lot of kickbacks. I mean, there's 
there's jokes ad nauseum around the codes that we bring out and um, the emails that we send all around value, value, value. We're trying to go from a value brand to a values brand, right? Like what are the values that we hold dear? What do we wanna be doing in the world beyond selling clothes? Um, and I think that's really just a huge North Star for us is uh, thinking about values and leading there first, rather than how are we going to um, generate the most business in the marketplace? Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point because all things being equal, I mean, in in nineteen in the early nineties, nineteen ninety four, I think um, the idea of having um, a, a kind of stylish brand at that price point in those markets like was really breakthrough. The industry will always chase you, like no matter what you do. You know, this happens a lot on CPG, but it's like, you know, these CPG companies will put so much time, money, energy, effort into like a unique technology or selling proposition. They'll be first to market. That's valuable for a while. But if it's good, everybody will replicate it or leapfrog past it. And soon the thing that was the differentiator becomes the norm. Um, if it's always built on like logical persuasion and that unique selling proposition that no one else has, um, the line is just always going to kind of move on you versus I think, you know, you want to have like quality product design. Like there's, these things are not mutually exclusive, but being that values brand, I think becomes something that people will choose you for, um, particularly values driven consumers, which more and more are. Um, the other thing I was going to add on this one is like, I think the business case, I was not working on this five years ago when these conversations were first happening, um, but the business case for this one probably felt easier just because it was such a big underserved market. I mean, when you've got the traditional, you know, fashion retail only going up to size 14, but the average size being a 16, 18 plus and like 68% of the you know market being a size 16, like there's a huge unserved audience there. So my guess is that like, that was probably a great wedge in the door for changing how we're going to do something because the math was was easy to do. Um, but I think by doing that first, what we're actually seeing is like that puts wind in the sails for other initiatives. Like when you see the fact that that wasn't just relevant to plus size shoppers, but actually was relevant to all shoppers. And so much of that, I think, has to do with the way that the team treated the messaging like this isn't everyone value. This is an everyone concern. Um, and when you see the earned media and the preference and the brand trackers move because of that, um, I, I think it makes it easier to make the case for audiences that maybe are, are not as big, but are still underserved and know that like, if you put in the time and energy and money and operational difference, um, you know, use the example of the gender, gender neutral clothing or the, the all gender clothing that won't just matter to people who are personally affected by it, that will matter to people who care about those people and people who have people like that in their lives and people who just think that's the right thing to do. And all of a sudden, like your math for the business case gets much bigger because you're driving preference beyond yes. what can otherwise be dismissed as a niche audience. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for adding that. Yeah. That is absolutely a huge part of why we decided to go after this um, in, in this year. I think it was the opportunity. And I the other side of your question is how we can turn how we in turn can sell biz, big disruptive business ideas. And I think that was part of it, right? It's a little bit of futurist work. Five years ago, there was talk around do we actually want to open up old navy plus size stores? Um, was that part of an idea that we could carry. And I think that's the, I, that is very much the, the future thinking, where is the business going? What are the trends that are happening, right? When we talk about like generation alpha, what are the, um, what are the ideas and the appetite there? And, and not just thinking about this year, two years from now, but five to 10 years down the road, um, how do you 10 X an idea? I think brands like Old Navy, what's so exciting about this is we're not a small business. We're not a fledgling business. There's a huge footprint. And when we bring out an idea, it can actually make extraordinary impact in the industry and beyond. Um, and so I think when you're thinking about what are those next big disruptive business ideas, it is what is the opportunity? Where do you see things going? I think it is a little bit of like a visionary work, right? But the numbers were there for an audience that was incredibly underserved. 
um, when we talk about you know, what is the average size and where is that going? It seemed pretty clear to make that business case. I also think this is a place where being crystal clear on what your brand stands for and your values is really important because I can understand why they'd be like, oh, there's a growing plus size audience. We should open plus size stores. But for a brand that has always been about like the democracy of style, it's like, well, no, actually, this is about everyone getting to participate. So having a separate experience is really misaligned from our values as a brand. Um, that's actually a really helpful lens that I think casts over other things. Kelly um, had a great question, which I do not know the answer to. JCP, you may. Um, will this approach impact your sister brands like Gap, Athleta, Banana? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, I think what's really interesting about Old Navy in the portfolio, the family of brands, is we're often the one to pilot and or lead an initiative. Um, and so I think it's very much a watch and see. There's definitely for each of the brands, there is a force rank of their own values and a force rank of their own priorities, right? So for us, it is about being inclusive. For us, it's about access for everyone. Um, and, you know, I think everyone has that list. And, and I think it is really seeing how um, something like size inclusivity can impact the others. But I haven't heard necessarily if there's initiatives rolling out um, in the near future, but it is good context to know that we often pilot and lead um, and then the other brands will follow. The, oh, one other thing I was gonna throw on and then there's some other great questions in the chat. There's a phrase, I don't remember what it is, but basically refers to the idea that when like you bring down, when you pull down a barrier for one group of people, it has like unexpected positive impacts for others. And like one of the big examples um, is curbs. Like when the ADA started saying that we need to change curb design. So in the corner, they you know degrade slowly so that someone in a wheelchair can wheel down. Like obviously that was a big deal for people in wheelchairs, but the truth is like now anyone in a stroller or on a bicycle um, or on a scooter, you know, or frankly, just in high heels, like that actually made everybody's experience better. And I think um, I use that example to say, like, as you guys are fighting for ideas, um, you know, if you're only selling it in on the impact for one small community, depending on the values and the bravery of the marketer, you might be able to sell it in, but definitely don't be afraid to think beyond and think about the ripple effects of how tearing down a barrier for one group of people will actually be relevant to and impactful for more than that just group of people. Because I think that goes back to the business case. Um, and I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of CEOs in the world who are like, I would love to just do things because they're the right thing to do, but I have shareholders or I have a board um, mm -hmm. or we're not a charity, et cetera, et cetera. And to be actually be able to say, it's actually not just about the audience and market size you're designing for. It's the people who care about them, the people who share those values um, and the people who will be impacted beyond just that audience. I think sometimes that can help justify. Um, there's a good question here from Leanne. I've always been told that the concept needs to still be doable without a celebrity for it to make sense. Um, at what point in the ideation stage for Old Navy do we decide to bring ADN? Um, I definitely would agree if for no other reason than like I've seen so many incredible ideas built on celebrities that like you will never get like you you might never get because they are too expensive or because they are unavailable or because they don't do commercial work or because they don't like that particular brand. Um, and it's just such a time killer if you spend all the time selling something in around someone that you later can't have and you're basically starting over after that or um you're like okay well who else could maybe do it in which case it's like you it's like designing a, a custom dress and then putting it on someone else like it might be fine but it's never going to fit in quite the same way so i definitely agree i think concepts should be bigger than celebrities one of the ways that we think about it when we concept specifically for Old Navy, the work always has this combination of like product news because it's a retailer and, and like many retailers, there is a seasonal and there is a product. Um, that doesn't mean that the product, you know, benefits have to be core to the messaging, but we know that we're going to be talking about spring dresses in the spring and, you know, the Old Navy flag tee is iconic. So you're going to have like some red, white and blue in the summer and, um, you know, active and jeans in the fall. And like, this is kind of like the rhythm. So every initiative we look at 
Like what's the product news? Um, what is kind of a cultural insight? Because this is a brand that, um, that I think has permission to kind of play with pop culture. And so we are often looking at like, what is the mood or the zeitgeist, um, et cetera during this period of time or around this trend? And then what is a cultural amplifier? And the amplifier can be a celebrity or it can be a TikTok trend or it can be a hashtag or it can be um, really anything in the world, but it's something that we think will help elevate the idea or the message. And I think this is a really great example where 80 was the amplifier. Like she wasn't the idea, but we had a message that people cared about, including celebrities, which is why I think she was agreed to do this work and she amplified it. So 80 was actually pretty late to the um, the process. Obviously, this is a work that began years ago because it was a big, you know, operational lift. But even within the campaign concepting, um, actually, the first concept involved body yadi yadi, which for obvious reasons, and we were in love with it. Um, and then we couldn't get it because Megan Thee Stallion has her own like deal, like that we wouldn't, you wouldn't even think that it was a conflict, you know? Um, but it's a brand that like, I don't know, maybe also has leggings or maybe she was getting ready to launch a leggings brand um, and thus she wouldn't license her song. And so if the whole idea is built on a song and you can't get that song or it's built on a celebrity and you can't get that celebrity and you're having to go back to the drawing board, it's just hard versus like concepting something and then being like, who is the perfect person to kind of amplify this or bring it to life, which I think is what, um, we got with 80. And then once you have the person, you can think about all the extensions. Now that we have that like rock, you know, in the river, where are all the places that it can flow? So that's how I would think about that.